Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to join me in one of my trips into the past, in search of one of those bizarre and amusing episodes that tend to pop up every now and then. So follow me into the old TARDIS and we'll get this adventure on the road. This time, we're on our way to the first half of the 19th century, to an up-and-coming city in the United States of America called New York, formerly New Amsterdam, and we're going to investigate a series of six articles that appeared in the public press. Ah, I do believe we've arrived. The date is August the 25th, 1835. And this man is reading a copy of the Sun newspaper. No, not that one. The Sun was a New York newspaper that had started life only two years earlier, and carried on running until the middle of the 20th century. Even so, it was already considered a serious paper, like the more successful New York Times and Herald Tribune. Not the sort of paper that will play a prank on its readers, you understand. And that's why, when readers of the Sun, on August 25th, read the following headline, they believed it. Great Astronomical Discoveries by Sir John Herschel at the Cape of Good Hope. The article claimed to have been reprinted from the Edinburgh Journal of Science, which is why it referred to the British public rather than the Americans. It went on to give details of a new telescope that had been constructed in South Africa by Sir John Herschel, and so the first of our suspects enters the story. Sir John was probably England's foremost astronomer, being a fellow of the Royal Society, which was, and still is, Britain's most prestigious scientific organisation, and a knight of the realm as well. To cap it all, he was the son of William Herschel, the man who discovered the planet Uranus. His academic credentials were impeccable. The story was further strengthened by including mathematical details of the telescope in South Africa, which was too far away for anyone in New York to check for themselves. As a setup, it was perfect. Blind the readers with science, use the name of someone highly respected in the scientific world, and dress the whole thing up in the most lurid and hyperbolic language. The Great Moon Hoax was ready for takeoff. Day two, and we start to get some of the juicy details. After several hundred words describing how Sir John went about constructing his telescope, the newspaper finally related what he saw when he turned it towards the moon. The first thing to strike him was the rock, which was described as green-brown basalt, similar to the pillars found on the Scottish island of Staffa. Dr Grant describes in the article how these rocks were covered in dark red flowers. Ah yes, Dr Andrew Grant, the channel through which all this information came back from the Cape of Good Hope. And so enters the second suspect in this sordid tale. Not a great deal is known about the mysterious Dr Grant, for reasons which will become apparent later on. One thing we do know about the good doctor is that he had a lot to say for himself. He described how the view through the telescope had shown a lunar forest full of trees, all of the same kind, next to a level green plain, and beyond that some sort of lake. They saw tall, slender, lilac-coloured pyramids in groups of thirty or forty, and finally animals, large herds of creatures that looked like a smaller versions of brown bison. There were blue, goat-like creatures each with one single horn like a unicorn, and several water birds, including black and white cranes, with extremely long legs and bills. Finally, the article describes spherical creatures, like large pebbles, which rolled very fast across the landscape and ended up in the water. So, welcome to the surface of the moon, folks, which apparently looks like this. Day two ended with promises to describe even more exciting animal discoveries. The sun did not disappoint. On day three, Dr Grant reported seeing oval mountains and extinct volcanoes through the telescope. No fewer than 38 species of tree, more than 50 species of other plants, nine species of mammals, and five species of egg-laying creatures. By this point, alarm bells should have been ringing, but they weren't. How did the good doctor know that these creatures were mammals? Did he actually see any of them actually laying eggs? 
And exactly how good was that telescope anyway? The prize discovery, reported on day three, was that of the biped beavers, which walked on two legs, carried their babies in their arms, and lived in huts. Plumes of smoke coming from those huts showed that they had mastered fire, or perhaps they were just very accident prone. The next day, the article referred to a ring of red hills, which Dr. Grant called the Ruby Colosseum, and within that ring, the first sign of humanoid creatures. At this point, we actually have a picture that I can show you. This is quite a famous print, although I've been unable to discover its exact origins and date. It shows the biped beavers, as well as the humanoids, which Dr. Grant termed Verspatilio Homo, or Man Bat. According to Grant, they were covered except on the face with short and glossy copper-coloured hair, and had wings composed of a thin membrane, without hair lying snugly upon their backs. They were also seen to be talking to each other, from which he inferred that they were rational creatures, and he went on to state that some of their amusements would but ill comport with our terrestrial notions of decorum. It would appear that the creatures were mating with each other out in the open. On day five, the editor of The Sun, a man called Richard Adams Locke, was faced with a problem, namely how to top the revelation of the man bat creatures. Locke is the third of our suspects in this case. Born in Somerset, England, he had been expected to go to university and then take over the running of the family estate. However, because of his radical anti-monarchist views, he decided to move himself and his family to New York in 1832 to work as a freelance writer. Fortunately, the solution to Locke's problem was at hand, as further reports from the Cape included descriptions of a mysterious abandoned temple, built of polished sapphire, as shown in this print from the time. And on this occasion, the print comes with a pedigree, as it was published by the Sun itself in 1835. You can see that the roof of the temple, which was built out of yellow metal, was shaped to look like a mass of flames. Clearly these man -bat creatures were fire worshippers. The sixth day, on the final day in August, also marked the final report from the Cape of Good Hope. Perhaps regretting his account of the indecorous behaviour that the man -bats got up to, Dr Grant reported the discovery of a larger and superior species of man -bat, which spent its time collecting fruit and bathing, rather than mating in public. However, he also reported that some fool had left the telescope in a position where it had caught the rays of the sun and burned down one wall of the observatory. By the time that it had been repaired, the moon had moved out of position and couldn't be viewed. So, there you are. You don't need me to tell you that the whole thing was the most outrageous hokum, the tallest of tall tales, with absolutely no evidence to back it up, and yet people believed it. Most of the other New York newspapers reprinted the articles, giving it so much coverage that within days it had reached places such as Boston, Philadelphia and Cincinnati. Within a month the story had crossed the Atlantic back to the old world in Europe. Amongst all this excitement there were a few voices of scepticism. The New York Herald wrote, This ingenious hoax is going the round still. Every paper that we receive from the West brings it back again. The Bowery Theatre has dramatised it, and now Hannington, a New York museum, has actually put it on canvas and placed it for exhibition in his diorama. Of course, this saltiness could just have been because the Herald was the Sun's main rival. In fact, the story had been thoroughly debunked as early as August the 31st in that same newspaper by James Gordon Bennett. The Sun had always proclaimed that their account had been reprinted from a recent issue of the Edinburgh Journal of Science, but Bennett pointed out that the journal had stopped publishing in 1833, when it was taken over by a London publication. Even so, with the story thoroughly discredited, the Sun's reputation didn't really receive any serious knock. It would appear that many people in those days simply bought their newspapers for entertainment, and whether the stories were true or not was a secondary concern. They enjoyed it equally when Locke and Bennett began sniping at each other regularly in their respective newspapers. So which one of these suspects was responsible for the hoax? Well, Dr Andrew Grant is the easiest to discount, as he never actually existed. It would appear that the eminent doctor was just as much a part of the hoax as the lunar discoveries. As for Sir John, he was indeed in South Africa at the time, and had no idea that his name was being taken in vain, 
thousands of miles away. It wasn't until months later that he was informed of the hoax, and it utterly astonished him. After he had recovered, he laughed it off, although in later years he complained bitterly about the large number of inquiries he was still getting about his supposed observations. No, I think we can discount Sir John Herschel. Which only leaves one person left in the frame. Richard Adams Locke, at first vehemently denied any part in creating the story, stating that he was simply reporting the story faithfully as it had been related to him. However, it appears he later admitted in a bar to a fellow journalist that the whole thing was entirely his invention, and the journalist in question made the omission public. Locke certainly faced no consequences for his deceit. He gave up journalism in 1842 in favour of a prestigious government job and lived to a ripe old age. So, there you are. In these few minutes, I've only been able to give a brief outline of the Great Moon Hoax, the first mass media event in history. I found a full and detailed account online, and you'll find the link below. Please do give it a visit if you want a thorough coverage. And here we are, back in the present day. And by pure luck, we've materialised right next to Richard's wall of cool doodiness, with its brand new portrait. Miss Misa runs a very enjoyable channel, on which she gives her opinions on society and life in general, and I never miss a video she produces. Having described all sorts of bizarre alien monsters, I wanted to promote something equally grotesque, outlandish and unnatural, and I immediately thought of her. Friend I rate Bear. But she's a lot prettier than he is, so she gets the place on the wall. I hope you enjoyed the video, and will join me again when I take my next journey through history. Goodbye.